uh, in the discussion, as everybody was logging in, Magnus said he likes to have a title slide that's a little bit of an advertisement, including the speaker's photograph. So I quickly pasted that on there. Um, so you can see who I am if you don't know what I look like in an office. Uh, so, okay, so the title of the talk today, um, response of the Greenland ice sheet to past Arctic warmth uh, generating field data for ice sheet modeling. So I'm actually trying to see if I can minimize the thing with people's pictures. I don't know how to do that. Uh, because I gave myself, ah, that works. Okay, cool. Back to the laser pointer. Okay. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a is a picture of um, a few of us uh, taking some bedrock core samples on Greenland last summer, and I'm going to tell you about this later on in the talk. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about. Um, uh, basically, I want to talk about this uh, project that um, we started recently called the Green Drill Project. Uh, but before I get to Green Drill, the why, how, what, and where part of Green Drill, I want to talk about uh, the importance of observations of past ice sheet change. And, and what I mean by past here is like the geologic past, so geologic observations and reconstructions. Then I want to tell you about the Green Drill project, and then I want to share some slides about some field work we did last summer, and I'll end with uh, describing the plans we have for drilling through the ice and into the bed below the ice uh, this May in just a few months' time. Okay, uh, what do I do next? Spacebar, that's going to be the mode. No, how come it only worked once? Lovely. You may have to use the up and down arrows once you're using the laser pointer. Yeah, that sounds right. Thanks, Tavi. Okay, here's Greenland on its side. It's taking a nap, which is what I should be doing right now here in Norway. Um, and what you see here are two depictions of the LGM ice extent. So this is uh, how fat the Greenland ice sheet got during the peak of the last glacial maximum. Uh, in my view, and actually in some other people's views, it's probably even larger than that dark blue outline back there. But here's a couple of published reconstructions anyway. And what we can do with geologic records, uh, how come it works sometimes? Okay, is to um, uh, create uh, 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 geochronology data points. So what you're seeing on this map is a yellow dot for every radiocarbon date um, on or around Greenland and, and a, green, a red dot for every cosmogenic nuclear exposure age, in this case, beryllium 10 around the perimeter of Greenland. Um, these kinds of data combined with geomorphic reconstructions of moraines and outwash plains and deltas and things like that help us piece together what the ice sheet did uh, between the last glacial maximum and its present configuration. So these are sort of these glacial geologic ground truth observations uh, that give us uh, scraps that are scraps of evidence that tell us what the ice sheet did from its maximum phase uh, through the last deglaciation and, and through the Holocene in some cases up to today's extent. When it comes to the Holocene, um, uh, following that deglacial phase, it's a bit trickier to try to reconstruct where the ice sheet was. Um, so what you're looking at here are a couple of really classic temperature uh, time series through the Holocene. These are borehole temperatures from GRIP and DI3. And they basically show that there were portions of the Holocene. So this is age back to 8,000 years. There were portions of the middle Holocene that were warmer than present, although present as it's defined is, is creeping up. The report just came out that this 2022 was the fifth warmest year on record. And, and apparently the last eight years are the warmest uh, ever recorded as a group of years. So depending on how you define present, but in any case, we had a warmer early Holocene. Here are some different kinds of reconstructions and, and now warmest to the left, not right as in the last one, but here are some higher resolution ice core based data that also say that the Holocene was warmer than today, although here we are approaching that warmth. The phase of warmth in these reconstructions is a little bit different 
than those borehole records. And it might have to do with some of the differences, might have to do with seasonality and so on. In any case, we are thinking that the Holocene was warmer than present. So we're curious how the ice sheet responded to that. Um, it's a bit tricky to know because the traditional glacial geologic approaches we use to reconstruct ice sheet size through time uh, uh, aren't as available when ice was smaller than it is at present. So if the present day footprint of a glacier covers the ground, we don't have access to the ground to piece together uh, that period of its history. So for that, we rely, largely we rely on ice sheet modeling. And uh, the left diagram here is the present ice sheet and the middle and right diagrams are particular um, simulations of the Greenland ice sheet during some time during the middle Holocene. Um, and so what can we say about whether these are true or not? Well, there are a few um, approaches we can use to try to understand if the ice sheet was smaller or not than present. Um, one of which is by exploring sediment records from around the perimeter of the Greenland ice sheet. So here is an example from on land. This is a proglacial lake in Western Greenland. And it's one of my uh, areas of expertise. So I'm showing you this example. Uh, you can take a sediment core from this proglacial lake basin and, and pull up a sediment core from like that red dot area, for example, and you can look at the sediment stratigraphy. And what you commonly see in these kinds of environments is that the base of a sediment core might be gray silt, which is the proglacial rock flower. Then there's a phase of organic material without glacial input, and then it's capped by the most recent sediments, which are the proglacial rock flower again. So these kinds of basins tell you that they were ice free in the middle Holocene, corresponding with those time periods of warmth, and that the ice sheet you see on the skyline up here was further recessed, smaller ice than at present. Uh, recently, there have been uh, an increasing number of similar kinds of records like from these proglacial lakes that I'm showing you now, but from fjords surrounding Greenland. And a lot of the sediment infills in fjords, for example, uh, down fjord from Peterman Glacier, Ryder Glacier up north, other glaciers in South Greenland, they also show from the marine sediment facies that there's a period in the middle Holocene where those ice shelves weren't there. For example, the ice sheet must have been smaller than, than present. The other, um, ty another type of, of evidence, geologic evidence that suggests that the ice was smaller than today has to do with um, marine fossils that are reworked into moraines that are surrounding the ice sheet. So here's a simple cartoon on the left that shows an ice-free fjord, a glacier advance through that fjord, and then a period of glacial recession after that glacier advance. But that glacier advance deposits a moraine. Uh, and when the glacier advanced, it scooped out marine mud. And these are all different types of fossils people have found in moraines uh, around the perimeter of the Greenland ice sheet, documenting that it was smaller than it, than it is today or than it was during the Little Ice Age maximum phase. Here's a, an example of, of that kind of work from a Pernovic um, uh, East Fjord, that those series of ice streams that are the Pernovic system. Uh, a, quite a bit of recession from a little ice age maximum phase in the white line. And you walk around on these islands out here and you look at the moraines and you see an assemblage of, of marine fossils that have been scooped out of the ocean and put on, the, on these islands. Uh, another a photograph I decided to include here um, shows a, a student of mine, Sandra, um, from maybe nine or ten years ago. And also, this is a cool thing where um, this is regulation ice in the bottom of a, a, a outlet glacier on Greenland, and it has frozen onto the bottom of the glacier, which is now advancing over this island, um, marine sediments, freezing on marine sediments. And we were picking out marine shells from those frozen on marine sediments. So again, just more evidence that the glacier was overriding previously ice-free waters. So there is, back to this slide I showed earlier, there, there's definitely evidence of that the Greenland ice sheet was smaller than it is today, almost all around the entire ice sheet perimeter. Uh, but in very few cases do we know how small it got. That's kind of where our knowledge ends. We don't know how small the Greenland ice sheet got during 
the middle Holocene. And so we're left to sort of uh, lean on this ice sheet modeling uh, and trying to do the best we can to ground truth it around the perimeter where we do have scraps of evidence. Stepping back to the previous interglaciation, um, constraining how small the Greenland ice sheet was during the previous interglacial, as many of you know, is, is one of the major challenges that, um, that really the paleoclimate community has. It's of huge importance. And the uh, available data we have to benchmark simulations or to, to ground truth simulations are, are really few. Uh, this is a study that some of you may know a few years ago that basically just compares different ice sheet models or and in some cases forcing of different ice sheet the forcings that's used the climate forcing used in these different ice sheet models and you see a whole range these are all simulations of the last interglaciation of greenland during the last interglaciation and you can see the 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 range in what in what's simulated um, also maybe a little bit of difference in the timing of what's been simulated traditionally people use these red dots which are the ice core sites that go from the surface of the ice sheet to the bedrock. People traditionally use these red dots as the available ground truth. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, however, really only a few of these, uh, Die 3, the Summit Ice Cores, and North Grip are on uh, ice divide sites. The rest of them are on ice flow sites like Neem and Camp Century and uh, East Grip, obviously. So when you look at the bottom of an ice core and you see last interglacial ice, perhaps at the bottom of the ice core, of course, that ice could have been injected into that ice core site. So it's it's uh, it's really difficult to know if, for example, at Camp Century Neem, if, if these are places that had Emian ice or not. Um, but probably Die 3 Grip and GISP 2 and North Grip are really solid sites for telling us that ice was there during the last interglaciation. But bottom line, um, we don't have a lot of ground truth data to lean on to validate these simulations. Um, so what I want to talk about today is start talking about a, a relatively new approach um, that we can try to adopt and apply in the future, um, which has to do with analyzing material we get from the bed uh, of the ice sheet. Uh, we have two cases where this has occurred uh, at the bottom of the GISP-2 core in a paper published more than five years ago now, uh, there was some bedrock obtained below the ice, and that bedrock was uh, attempted to measure cosmogenic nuclides in it in the 1990s that proved a little bit inconclusive. And then when the technology got better on the cosmogenic nuclide side, on the analytical side and the laboratory side, we were able to, um, well, Jörg Schaefer and his, his colleagues were able to do a better job of that and publish some interpretable results. Uh, a little bit later in time. And then following that study, uh, some legacy material that wasn't in the form of bedrock, but in the form of sediment was analyzed from the bottom of Camp Century. And these two records, it's the cosmogenic nuclides in these records, which are probably the most um, robust or, or relevant techniques to tell us about ice sheet presence absence in terms of timing and its response to past interglaciations. This is a nice figure I like to show that um, Drew, uh, Chris compiled uh, in his uh, PNAS paper showing the various ice cores that go through the ice sheet and whether they collected basal material or not. And here's the GISP-2 bedrock that was analyzed in the Schaefer paper and some sediments that were looked at in Drew's work that's also ongoing, by the way. Okay, so um, transitioning over to the Green Drill project. So, um, and I'm going to get a little bit more into the methodology uh, that we're going to employ on this bedrock if we're lucky enough to obtain it. But the idea is that we know that there's crucial information stored in the bed of the ice sheet, and we want to try to get more of that. So that's the Green Drill Project. Now, the idea for this project was that uh, rather than spending year after year after year at one very deep ice core site and then going into bedrock, what if we could use a slightly lighter drill to drill thinner ice locations so we can increase the number of sites, increase N on the sub ice material collected. So we're working with the US ice drilling program, this uh, wonderful group of people, and we're using the um, agile sub ice geological drill ACIG. 
that ASIG drill um, has obtained a bedrock core in its lifetime from the West Antarctic ice sheet through about 150 meters of ice thickness. Uh, it went through the West Antarctic ice sheet and obtained uh, near Pirit Hills in the background here, and it obtained an eight meter long bedrock core. The drill requirements for this particular drill is that uh, you need ice thinner than about 700 meters thick, and you need frozen bedded conditions because basically you need a sealed hole from the ice and into the rock so you don't leak out your drilling fluid. You can also obtain basal ice. It's maybe not in quite as pristine shape as uh, you would if you were using like a thermomechanical drill for like an ice core, but the drill bit can be changed so you can collect ice when you want to. So the idea is to also maybe collect the silty ice just before penetrating the bed. So here's the concept. Uh, let's say this is the present uh, profile of the Greenland ice sheet, you know, and, and we have our ASIG drill site up here. We drill through and we collect a core of bedrock there. Uh, back to the earlier part of the talk where we want to know how small the Greenland ice sheet got during the Holocene. The first test is, was this exposed or not during the middle Holocene? Uh, and then maybe we can piece together some other isotope techniques to figure out what the site's history was maybe in relation to prior interglacials, 5E, stage 11, and so on. There's a second drill in the arsenal of the US drilling program called the Winky drill. Its depth ice thickness requirements are no thicker than like 120 meters or something like that. Uh, working now on scaling that up to 200 meters. It's a much more uh, used drill than the ASIC so far. It's been used a lot of times. And we want to use that out here at the closer to the ice edge. Of course, um, I think about deep geologic time a lot. And so uh, my time scales of interest go all the way back to the LGM. And of course, the present ice sheet position is really just a snapshot in time, but we know it's been smaller than today's extent and larger than today's extent. And so we want to do some drilling beyond the ice to get bedrock cores from out here. And we can use a different kind of drill, this thing called the Shaw drill. It's just a little uh, gas powered engine, like a chainsaw engine kind of thing on top of a drill stem. And you can get um, multiple meter long cores into, into rock out there. And then in these um, rock cores, we want to measure a whole family of cosmogenic nuclides. So here's five, uh, radiocarbon, chlorine-36, aluminum-26, beryllium-10, and neon-21. And other than neon, the rest of these are radioactive. And not only that, but they have different half-lives. Each one of these four on the left has a different half-life. And so if you have isotope systematics with two isotopes of different half-lives, half then you can start using these things as burial clocks in the half-lives, the concentrations deviate as a function of burial time. So um, here are uh, somewhat complicated diagrams from the Schaefer paper, and I'm not going to go into all the details here, but this is the rock core below GISP-2 uh, core uh, depth here. You can see it was about a meter and a half. And then in red and in blue, these are the measurements of beryllium-10 and aluminum-26 at various intervals at depth in the rock core. Uh, one thing we know about cosmogenic nucleotide accumulation in, in surfaces is that it, the concentration attenuates with depth, the production attenuates with depth. And so the advantage of measuring these isotopes in multiple levels in the core and not only the surface, like a surface grab sample below an ice core, is that you can test if you have an intact paleo surface or not. If the concentrations don't change with depth, then you don't have an intact paleo surface. If, however, they fall along this, this expected exponential, if this is the surface up here, you can confirm that you have a paleo surface and then you're in business in terms of using this site as an archive of past ice sheet history. The difference, the ratio of these two isotopes in this diagram I'm not going to explain on the right, uh, is, is gives you the burial duration. So this paper by Schaefer et al. were able to conclude that below Summit Greenland uh, was sometime ice-free within the last million, million and a half years. Uh, 
And I think a lot of us before that study would have assumed that the Greenland ice sheet grew, nucleated in maybe the eastern mountains and grew in the middle of Greenland, probably at the beginning of the Quaternary or the latest Pliocene. And it was more or less that core stayed there throughout the duration, maybe like wobbled along its fringes. And this paper suggested actually that model may not be true, but maybe there was some time even like a million years ago when even that part of central Greenland was ice free. Um, since that paper, uh, this is um, Allie Balter Kennedy. She's a PhD student at Lamont working with Jörg Schaefer. Um, and we've worked together on a long bedrock core we have from right near the terminus of Jakobsav and Ispray, four meter long core. And here's uh, these constant, these all these measurements per depth. And here's that surface profile um, that I was talking about in this left diagram. And something that she's been able to piece together is just uh, other ways we can use this depth profile information. We're able to piece together um, glacial erosion rates, um, clearly not so big that they're wiping out the signal, um, but we can piece together some constraints on glacial erosion rates. And again, we can tell if we have an intact surface or not by measuring these concentrations versus depths. So just to summarize, cosmogenic radionuclides in bedrock cores. Um, isotope pairs uh, tell us about burial exposure history. I didn't mention this, but you probably know that radiocarbon has a very short half-life. It's 5,000 years. The rest of these half-lives of these isotopes, by the way, are hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So the radiocarbon has such a short half-life that if a piece of rock of the surface below the ice sheet was ice-free in the Holocene, it would have a measurable C14 inventory. If it wasn't exposed during the Middle Holocene warm period, then there would be no C14 in that rock sample. So we have a very easy binary tool in our toolkit to look for Holocene exposure. The depth profiles are really key because the shape ensures that we have a paleo surface. And then the deeper data down in like the three to four meter range, they can give us some insights into uh, glacial erosion rates, and that's something that Ali helped us work out. Okay, so we want to um, find some sites around the Greenland ice sheet where we can measure cosmogenic radionuclides to directly inform ice sheet simulations of past response to interglacials. Um, our group uh, first had to figure out where around Greenland can we use these drills to get into quartz bearing bedrock. These cosmogenic nuclides I had mentioned are all produced in the mineral quartz, uh, largely quartz. Uh, so quartz is our target material. So we wanna figure out where can we go around Greenland to satisfy the drill requirements, satisfy the requirements for the cosmogenic nuclide measurements. And then what can we do to satisfy some scientific questions we have? So that all got put in this paper that came out this last fall, Drill Site Selection. And I'm going to walk you through that. Um, I want to credit a uh, PhD student of mine right now, Caleb Walcott, who um, I worked with on all this GIS stuff. So we need frozen bedded conditions. And if we use Joe McGregor's basal thermal state version two, oh, that's now published, um, we can chop the entire footprint of the Greenland ice sheet down to about 37%. Um, yeah, so just we're using that as a template, or I mean, as a starting point for where it's warm and where it's cold. It, for those of you familiar with this study, it's basically combining all these SNP-6 simulations and their basal thermal states and figuring out where there's vast agreement about among these models about where it's frozen, and then leaning on some other types of little bit of data here and there. Okay, we also need thicknesses of less than 700 meters. So that chops the Greenland ice sheet footprint down to 15%. And here's this, I don't know, that's kind of an ugly green or something around the perimeter. And you combine those two. And now we have this pink color around the perimeter in the map on the left. And we're down to like 7% of the ice sheet footprint. Okay, well, we could also say, is it safe to work? We're not gonna set up the ASIC drill rig over like a crevasse region where there's like high velocity. Of course, we usually don't find these over frozen bedded areas, but nevertheless, um, I worked with my uh, colleague, uh, Kristen Poinar in Buffalo, and we worked together to try to figure out 
um, okay, like let's make a strain rate map across Greenland and assume that there's crevasses with this higher strain rate uh, of around this value. Um, and we don't want to work in those areas. We don't want to be anywhere near crevassing. So we can chop down a few areas from our map on the left. We get down to about 5%. And then we need to figure out where there might be quartz. Now, this is tough because the only knowledge of bedrock geology on Greenland comes from around its perimeter, where the bedrock is exposed, and maybe the GISP-2 site, <laughs> which has bedrock in the bottom. That's about it. Um, but what we can do is we can sort of take, because, because you can see already in this map that our sites are around the perimeter, we can sort of lean on the knowledge of the bedrock geology at the ice edge. And that actually knocks down uh, the, quite a bit, uh, a couple of percent here down to three and a half percent. Unfortunately, a lot of North Greenland, where we find cold bedded conditions right up to the icy, ice sheet edge, there's also a lot of like carbonate, bedrock and sedimentary basin fill formations. It's South Greenland, which tends to be warmer, is where you more reliably find crystalline rock. In any case, we're down to 3%. And now we have science objectives. Okay, so like, where would we go to try to piece together something cool to learn something about ice sheet history? It may not be randomly any one of these spots in red on this map, but um, we might have some strategy. In any case, we have maybe 3 or 4% of the Greenland ice sheet footprint available to probe using the ASIC drill, in theory. Okay, and so for, for a proposal that we wrote, uh, in like 2018, this is pre-pandemic, so like I don't have a very good memory of those times, but uh, we wrote a proposal and it got funded and then the pandemic happened, so this project has delayed quite a bit. But for that proposal, we selected four sites in North Greenland. And so these are our four areas for drilling. We selected a couple in, in uh, Northwest Greenland. We selected one area in uh, near Victoria Fjord where there's some outcropping of crystalline rock. The glacier has eroded down through the sedimentary cap rocks there and exposed some basement rocks. And then we decided to choose a site. We thought some sites look good over here in this Nunatax region of um, Droning Mod, uh, uh, no, Droning Louise Land in uh, Northeast Greenland. So just as a couple of examples, um, we lean heavily on the NASA ice bridge uh, radar data. Um, here's a radar line across this little thumb of, a, of the Greenland ice sheet called Prudhoe Dome. It's more or less an independent peripheral ice cap, except it's not because it's connected to the Greenland ice sheet, so it's called the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, and it's, it's called the Prudhoe Dome, and here's a flight line, and you can see the radar uh, data here of the bed and the surface, and that's about 500 meters. So we selected this for one of our sites that's within reach of the ASIG drill. And then another one of our sites is in, uh, like I said, in Northeast Greenland in this Nunatax area, uh, sort of on the side or the flank of the Northeast Greenland ice stream. And if we look at a topographic cross section, this is velocity, by the way, and if we look at a topographic cross section of X and X prime here, then Negus is kind of trucking along there. Here's the ice sheet profile. We've proposed to drill into sort of a uh, kind of a buried nunatak. It will be a nunatak when the ice sheet gets thinner or, or when it was thinner in the past. But we we thought it was kind of appealing to get some information right next to Negus. Um, now, how do these four like pixels on Greenland tie, uh, allow us to say anything about the entire Greenland ice sheet? Well, they kind of don't, but um, we're going to try to lean on some ice sheet modeling to scale up maybe this information to the broader ice sheet. Um, this is this really nice work you, you all know from Andy Ashwanden. And you can see here's our four sites in red. And when one meter of sea level is gone from Greenland, a couple of these sites are just coming out uh, from under the ice. And at two meters, some of these sites may be ice free, but there's still maybe one that's covered in ice. So this range of sites together may constrain um, this broader pattern of ice sheet recession or the magnitude of ice sheet response to passenger glacial warmth. Um, as part of our project team, we have Rob DeCanto uh, and his former student, who's now a researcher in Texas, Benjamin Kiesling. Um, 
And so Benjamin and, and Rob are, are modelers on this project and, and they can um, model the inventory of cosmogenic nuclides in the bed of, in basically in Greenland. And so when the ice sheet's small and they're simulating, and they can run a simulation that's through the whole quaternary. And when a pixel of Greenland becomes ice free, they can start accumulating isotopes. And then when a pixel of Greenland gets reoccupied by ice, they can start the burial systematics. So they can basically like burn in a cosmogenic nuclide archive in the bed as it would appear under a particular ice sheet history. So that's where we're going um, with the ice sheet modeling. Um, Benjamin has started to, you know, he's been modeling Greenland for a while now with Rob. Here's our four sites. This is one ensemble simulation that he's worked that he's done recently, which shows kind of what I showed before, where our site over here in Northeast Greenland uh, may not become ice free for quite a bit after, quite a bit later than some of our other sites of interest. Okay. Um, so that's basically the the importance of the Green Drill project, why we want to collect more data from the bed of the ice, uh, and then sort of the framework for this project and and how we're hopefully going forward. Our first field work uh, took place last uh, season, last spring and last summer, and we focused in Northwest Greenland to get this project started. Uh, Thule, uh, Air Force Base is down here somewhere. Um, Kanak is up here. And so there's some logistical infrastructure available to us to uh, st that makes it convenient to start working in this area in Northwest Greenland. And so remember this slide I showed earlier. It's obviously cartoonized and it's highly idealized experiment of, of how we want to take a collection of cores across a transect. And this is that um, experiment in reality. So here's Prudhoe Dome, and this is the Greenland ice sheet proper. And over here on the far right is the Hiawatha Glacier and the Hiawatha Crater. And this is called Inglefield Land. Humboldt Glacier is just off the image on the left there. And this is Baffin Bay over here. And here's some velocity uh, superimposed on a Landsat image. And so we were able to get into the field and collect Shaw drill cores from these locations and then surface samples from all these other yellow dots. And then these are sites we've identified on the ice. At least we identified them in our proposal years ago, seems like a decade ago, uh, ASIG drill sites and Winky drill sites. So one of the things that we're doing is um, we have the luxury of working with uh, Sridhar um, and his uh, uh, postdoc now, Nate Stevens. And so um, although we have really nice ice bridge data to lean on for site selection uh, ahead of time before we go put the ASIG drill on site, um, we're using our the, the geophysics team here to visit each site to do some seismics and ice penetrating radar to learn a little bit more about the nature of the bed of where we can drill. You know, we have a, a drill that's got a certain very small diameter and we have a giant area under the ice sheet and we need to figure out where best we can place that drill to maximize the chance that we get into bedrock. We really want bedrock. So we may not want for the purposes of this project, we may not want to drill into a basin we may not want to drill into like even a little swale in the landscape. Ideally, we drill into a topographic high and that increases the chance that we might get into bedrock or maybe only thin material and then bedrock. Um, we think that that would provide the cleanest record of past ice sheet change with the cosmogenic nuclide archives systems that we want to work with. So these guys went out last spring and did, did their uh, did their magic show up there and they're processing those data now and then following that spring in July um, we went out to the periphery of Prudhoe Dome this is on the north side here's here's our base camp um, to get these Shaw drill cores um, something that it's just a fascinating landscape and these are landscapes I've seen elsewhere in my other work but you can see how um, to my eyes, to the geologist's eyes, this is really weathered bedrock. 
and it was covered really recently in time, not only some of it during the Little Ice Age, but all of it during the last glacial maximum. But the amount of weathering of this bedrock, it looks like Joshua Tree National Park in the Mojave Desert or something like that. The amount of weathering you see in this bedrock um, cannot be explained by Holocene exposure alone. So this is evidence that the ice sheet was um, was cold based even at the LGM when this is when this was covered by an expanded Greenland ice sheet. So it's a great place to um, look to take bedrock cores um, because the bedrock is going to hold and archive all the previous cosmogenic nuclide inventory during its previous um, ice free exposed times. And then all those burial clocks are going to be ticking away during the ice burial times. So here's Jörg Schaefer um, using the Shaw drill setup. Uh, here are the little uh, diamond infused in this resin, uh, these drill bits that we use. Um, for those of you who've used this uh, Shaw drill, before or done other kind of drilling, you know that like there's a lot of tricks involved in swapping these bits and dressing them between going in rock and all that stuff. In any case, we were able to get a five meter core. Here's our bottom all segment. It comes up in segments because there's fractures and stuff like that. That doesn't bother us for the nuclide measurements, but we just need to do some really uh, nice office work here, making sure we get everything straight when it goes into the box and all labeled correctly. So five meters from, for example, this site, um, we have Shaw drill cores, a couple from the ice sheet margin, four and five meter cores, and then a little bit more distally, we have a core down here closer to the ocean. And then um, basically just wrapping up here. Um, so uh, this uh, April through June, we're going to put in a camp to do an ASIG drill here and a Winky drill here. We're just going to uh, get up here for one site. We're going to use the uh, DC3 Bassler. Um, from Thule to go uh, uh, to and from um, Thule up to here. It's going to be uh, quite a few Basler flights, like maybe 10 or 12, because there's 500 meters of ice we need to get through. So that's a lot of drill string and also drilling fluid. Um, so even though ASIG is, is, has the word agile in it, it's an agile drill compared to drilling three or four kilometers of ice. Um, but it's still um, quite a bit of a, a drill to get up onto the to an ice sheet like this. In the future, we're hoping we can do some traversing to maybe uh, have that be a little bit less risky in terms of getting all these flights in in a reasonable amount of time before something breaks or the weather just says no more. Um, and then we got to go through 500 meters of ice and then we got to get into the bedrock. And uh, while I'd say we're we're optimistic, uh, we acknowledge that there's some risk involved in, in making that happen. We're going to give it a go this spring. So just to wrap up here, um, we know uh, where to drill. I think we do. Um, uh, we're going to drill this May. So I'm, uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll have some success and I get to talk in a year's time with some results. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to conclude on this final point here about collaboration. So we're going to go put a borehole in through the ice sheet. And we are not, uh, you know, most of us aren't uh, borehole uh, ice sheet uh, scientists or hardly glaciologists. And so we think that there could be a lot of room for collaboration here. People putting in um, a thermistor string to the bed to try to get, you know, basal heat flux, temperature profiles, that kind of thing. So we we are really hoping um, and we're open-minded about people collaborating with us on this work, both this season and in our future drilling seasons. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Jason. Um, what we usually do with uh, questions is we ask people to just indicate on the chat that they have um, a question. Um, and then we get people to unmute and to ask their question so um, does anyone have a question for Jason? Or you can use the hands up thing uh, um, icon, although that's not always um, really easy to um, spot. Um, Tancreda, um, I apologize if I have mispronounced your name. Maybe you can correct me. No, that was fine. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes, that's great. Great. Uh, thanks, Jason. That was such a great talk. 
Um, I was just wondering whether when you get your ASIG cores and your bedrock, you're going to be able to get some subglacial erosion rates from that, or whether you actually need some ice marginal age from the deglaciation from COSMO combined with your paired nuclear analysis to get some subglacial erosion model in there. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think this is a part of Greenland, and thanks for the question. This is a part of Greenland where there is some knowledge of um, the deglaciation at the ice sheet margin boundary, and we made sure to collect samples that would allow us to build on prior work in that regard. The in situ C14, if that's available, if that is existing in these rock cores, which I'm sure it will in the wiki site, hard to know if it will or it won't in the ASIC site at this particular part of Greenland. Um, the amount of that inventory of C14 would help us constrain potentially the duration of ice free um, time period in the Holocene. And then, um, yeah, check out this paper by um, Allie Walter Kennedy. Um, she has this methodology where um, she looks at the, the beryllium-10 in the muon zone, and it turns out that there's more beryllium-10 than you would expect. There's excess beryllium-10 down there, and she thinks that that's because of um, steady glacial erosion through multiple glacial interglacial cycles. It kind of pumps up. It, it, there's a slow exhumation of the crust and it kind of pumps up beryllium 10 closer and closer to the surface and you get this excess amount down there in that deep zone below the below the spa, the spallation zone and so that's a methodology that might allow us to constrain not the glacial erosion rate in the last glacial cycle per se but but averaged over a longer time scales so that that's her paper in southwest greenland right that you mentioned yeah correct yeah, yeah jakob Sabin. yeah that's right great thanks a lot yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Is there any other questions for Jason? Um, I guess one question that's obvious is uh, what sort of first uh, surface uh, and full hole geophysics are you planning around these sites as part of the project? Yeah, um, none. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we were, um, you know, we're sort of hoping that people might uh, write a parallel proposal to capitalize on these boreholes. Um, but, you know, a lot of our budget is, is going into getting the material out and analyzing it, I'd say. Um, so we're not doing a lot of that, uh, that work that could be leveraged you know, with the fact that we have these camps on the ice. Because it would seem there would be a wonderful opportunity for synergistic, because uh, looking at how characteristic um, this particular borehole site is compared with sort of a bed around and so on, it would seem like uh, some wonderful uh, opportunities there. Yeah, I agree. I think um, in the future, if we can get uh, some traverse, um, uh, platform on Greenland going for subsequent seasons, it's probably going to be easier to have people invite people in um, to do that work. Um, but I think if, you know, if we can demonstrate, it's almost like this project is a proof of concept. If we can demonstrate that the SASIG and Winky drills are doing the job and, and giving us good stuff in North Greenland, I think it opens the door to a lot of other types of drilling, you know, not only into bedrock for cosmetic eucalyptus, but into these um sediment basins that you know people like guy are, are finding and um yeah there's, i think there's a lot of potential there's also a lot of potential in what we can measure in the material that we get out that's not just cosmogenic nuclides it wouldn't that basal ice we can do like luminescence dating we can look for macro fossils we can measure dna the community can do all these kinds of things now fantastic um any other questions uh for jason Uh, looks like not actually. I'll just check on uh, on Facebook, but I I didn't see any there. No, there's there's none on Facebook. So okay. thank you uh, very very much for uh, your talk, Jason. Um, yeah, me, yeah, it's going to be me, great. I can't. 
It's possible that Roger has a hand up. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Roger. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Thanks for spotting it, Jason. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, um, sorry if I missed it. I, I had to nip off and, and answer a phone call while you, while you were talking. How far down into the bedrock are you able or planning to go once you get down to base ice with these various drill sites? And linking to what Tavy said, I'm thinking about you know, uh, how, <coughs> how any physical properties that can be measured off the cores can be correlated to any future geophysics or the existing radar profile, ref, you know, ra radar reflectivity profiles you've got and so on. Yeah, um, I didn't, you didn't miss it because I didn't mention it. Um, ASIG in, in the past, in the one case study from Antarctica, got eight meters of core. Um, that would be plenty for our cosmogenic nuclide uh, analytical work. Um, so probably we're, we're going to be targeting in the five to eight meter range. Uh, that sounds really useful. I mean, and hopefully uh, your post field work plans as well as all the, the chemical stuff that um, you, you'll be able to measure some physical properties. Yeah, you know, you know, densities, PUA speeds, that that kind of thing. So we've got at least got those archived. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and this site, um, unlike some other sites that we we propose to drill, which are not on local ice divides like this one, this hole theoretically could stay open for some time if we, mm. you know, were proper about it. Uh, I think that's probably the case. Um, the velo the surface velocities at the site are are quite low. Um, so maybe it can be useful for the future by staying open. Yeah, just 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 a pity it's it's two lay Air Force Base and not you know Leeds Bradford Airport that's close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise, was... otherwise we'd love to take our <laughs> DAS system out there and uh, put it down the borehole. Sorry, um, a, a bit of a, a tangential thing. Right at the start, you were showing us the the cores that had rock flower above and below a, a big um, unglaciated interval. I've, I've yeah. been doing some work with Kelly Hogan at, at Bass uh, in in trying to pick out you know reflectivity, you know, modeling the reflectivity from from chirp data um, and tying it to the cores. And it, I think it's fair to say we were both surprised how successful it was uh, around awesome. Peterman. So it, is it? I know it's offshore, but is there much value for for you in in sort of mapping more of all of those? Absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of data out there right now that um, I, I, the groups that I know of uh, are compiling around Greenland to try to piece together a collective understanding of, of where the ice sheet was when those ice free periods were in these, in these fjord settings like you're describing. Um, several groups, one that I'm involved with, uh, are then using those data to try to improve simulations of the Greenland ice sheet through the Holocene. So those data are are really uh, really powerful and important. That sounds that's great. You got good success doing that. Smashing. Thanks very much. And if if we find we've got a spare weekend in May, we'll uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll pop up with our uh, our departmental airship and uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> geophysics kit. Cheers. Perfect. Perfect. So, any last questions or uh, imaginative uh, offers of fieldwork? Um, I think that was the end of the questions. Um, so, thank you very much indeed, Jason. Thank you for kicking off the uh, new year with uh, such a great talk. And just to say, next week we have two sea ice talks uh, from Robbie Mallet and uh, Patricia Dubrupinigny. Uh, one Arctic and one Antarctic. So um, hope to see people at the sea ice talks next week. So thanks uh, very much again, Jason. It was really nice um, to see that. Thank you, Tavian. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.